think sometimes when we come to the, the Bible overview uh, series, because we're trying to cram in so much, trying to look at a whole book in just 20, 25 minutes, um, we can go through it quite a pace. It can feel lecture-like. And we can forget that the whole of God's Word is pointing us to a relationship, pointing us to a relationship with Jesus. It's good just to remember that. We're going to dive, a deep dive into Lamentations in just a few moments. And I'm hoping that we'll remember this is, this is actually, it's all pointing us in some way to Jesus, who takes us to the heart of God. So remember that. If you've got a Bible near you, then turn, grab it, pick it up, turn to page 822. And there you'll find Lamentations. And I'm getting you to do that because my suspicion is that you won't have read it that much recently. <laughs> Has anybody read Lamentations today? Nikki, you superstar. <laughs> Has anybody read Lamentations this last week? This last month? Okay, this last year? See, that's, that's what I'm getting at. Like, we don't turn to Lamentations that often. And that's partly because it's full on. And, um, you know, when, when we're happy and we're thinking about what movies to watch on Netflix, we don't necessarily turn to a drama that's going to have us weeping. And that's kind of what we find in Lamentations. So, Lord, please use this time, even though it might feel lecture-like, please burn some of these words onto our heart. We know that we all find ourselves in a similar place to the author that was feeling so much pain. We thank you that you're never distant from our pain. Thank you that you inhabit our pain. That you know us inside out and you run toward us, not away from us. We love you. Amen. So, Lamentations. A little intro. Driving through Texas, a New Yorker collided with a truck carrying a horse. And a few months later... He tried to collect damages for his injuries. He'd, he'd been injured in that collision. And the insurance company's lawyer, he said, how can you now claim to have all these injuries? According to the police report, months ago at the time, you weren't hurt. Look, replied the New Yorker, I was lying on the road in a lot of pain. And I heard someone shout that the horse had broken his leg. The next thing I know, this Texas Ranger pulls out a gun and shoots the horse. Then he turns to me and asks me, are you okay? <laughs> but, um... <laughs> if we ever find ourselves able to laugh about suffering, it's always going to be from the perspective of hindsight. During the period of suffering, whether we're bruised, whether we're grazed on a Texas highway, whether we're confined to a bed with a pain that we've been living for for some time and it doesn't seem to subside, or... Just thinking of our Iranians fleeing a country because their lives are at risk just because of what they believe. Suffering feels merciless. Similarly, if we're ever to learn lessons through suffering, then nine times out of ten, they're going to come a little bit later with the perspective of hindsight. And this is what Lamentations conveys so poignantly. Suffering's not pretty. It's hard. Lessons learned in the furnace... They hurt. And yet it's the fact that God so often teaches the most profound lessons at those times which gives our suffering such profound dignity. You don't waste suffering if your eyes are on eternity. Uh, in the Hebrew canon, lamentation sits in the writings nestled between Ruth and Ecclesiastes. And if you read through the book, you might have been thinking to yourself, maybe if you read through it last year, Nikki, if you read through it earlier on today, you might have been thinking to yourself, this actually feels more like a psalm of lament than a prophecy. And yet we've got it there in the, in the prophets. Remember the writings? We were looking at those not too many months ago now. They're right at the heart of the Bible because they deal with the human heart. And they help us to make sense of things like pain, personal wars, pain, the pain that comes through wars, wars that never seem to end. That's wisdom literature. 
It was only actually when the Septuagint translators were per, you know, forming their Greek translation that they moved this book, Lamentations, into the prophetic writings immediately after Jeremiah. And the Septuagint translation of Lamentations actually begins like this, I quote, and it says this, because this should give you a bit of an understanding of what you're going to engage with when you read Lamentations. It says, And it came to pass, after Israel had been taken into captivity and Jerusalem had been laid waste, no, the suffering, that Jeremiah sat weeping and lamented this lamentation over Jerusalem and said, dot, dot, dot. And yeah, that's probably a later addition to the Hebrew text. But you can understand, can't you, why the translators would have thought such an addition was helpful because it immediately acknowledges what you're about to read. And it's presumably influenced by 2 Chronicles, chapter 35, verse 25. That reads... Jeremiah also uttered a lament for Josiah and all the singing men and singing women have spoken of Josiah and their laments to this day. And they made these a rule in Israel. Behold, they are written in the laments. And I think it's largely due to that verse in 2 Chronicles that the book of Lamentations, even to this day, is read aloud publicly in synagogues on the ninth day of the Jewish month of Ab as a memorial to the destruction of their temple. So it's, it's, you've got to understand that this is deep mourning. They've lost a load of stuff, and that's how these words are penned. And with that verse in 2 Chronicles in mind, and certainly with the, the, the superscription in the Septuagint translation to Lamentations, in my mind, there is no doubt that Jeremiah, who if you remember last week I called the weeping prophet, is the author of these words. Although I don't think anything is lost if you don't hold to that view. It's God-inspired and it's simply a work of art. Just a few more comments uh, by way of introduction. If, if we all read Hebrew, then A, we'd be reading it right to left. But we'd see something of the intricate structure of this book straight away. And, and it's lost in our English translations. The, the eagle-eyed amongst you, though, you might have noticed... That chapters 1, 2, 4, and 5 have how many verses? They have 22 verses, each of them. You know how many letters there are in the Hebrew alphabet? There's 22. And so if you were reading Hebrew, you'd notice that immediately. When we get to chapter 5, although there's still 22 verses, the intricate, what we'd call acrostic order, falls by the wayside. So... Um, with chapters 1, 2, and 4, it's like A, B, C, D. But chapter 5, we fail to see that. And it's just, you know, a, a mass of loads of different um, verses beginning with different letters. And we ask the question, why? And I think it's because it's a chapter that focuses on such personal suffering. And when we deal with suffering things seem to just get lost. We lose any sense of rhythm. We, we forget what we're doing half the time or we've got a plan to do next week or at least if we'd made plans, we think, oh, I can't commit to those plans now. I feel too low. We lose track of seasons. We lose track of night and day. At least that's how it feels, right? You ever been deep in suffering? That's chapter five. Lose the pattern. Suffering's uncomfortable. Feels chaotic. Feels uncontrollable. And I think that's what the author's getting at with chapter five. But then what about chapter three? You'd notice that I've missed chapter three. In chapter three, there aren't 22 verses. There are 66 verses. Three times as many as any of the other chapters. And you still get that acrostic pattern. So it begins, the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. You get three verses beginning and then bet, three verses beginning with bet. And again, the reason, I think, is more than any of the other chapters, that chapter focuses on personal pain. Jeremiah's personal pain. Lamentations. We're going to read various verses of Lamentations. I'm not going to read the whole thing right now. Yes. So you get this three, and that's partly because personal pain feels like it's never-ending. It just goes on and on and on. 
long-suffering. And you think of Jeremiah, this lonely man, representative of Judah as a whole, speaks of his personal suffering. Tough five chapters to read. As I've said, it depicts this two-year siege and destruction of Jerusalem. I believe it's almost certainly written during and shortly after the Babylonians devastated Jerusalem in 586 BC. And I say that because there's such vivid imagery in this letter. I'm conveying some of that. It's almost as though a reporter or a photographer has been dumped right in the middle of Jerusalem, this war zone, and he's just recording, recalling the sights, the sounds, the feeling. The only difference with this reporter is that they're personally invested in the pain. It's their home. So that's the intro. What can we learn from this little book on suffering? Four profound things. Firstly, sin has devastating consequences. Sin has devastating consequences. And you might think if you were here for the previous overviews on Isaiah and Jeremiah that we've dealt pretty exhaustively with with the ugliness of sin and... um, That might be the case, but the Bible likes to keep on whacking us with the same things that we really need to mull over. I'm not going to dwell too long on it, but we're not to miss the striking imagery Lamentations uses to depict the utter horror of what sin does to us. For example, in chapter 1, Judah is depicted as Lady Zion. In our overview so far, we've seen verses where God calls himself a husband to his people. The problem, however, and we alluded to this in Jeremiah, is that Judah has played, I use the word, the whore. The Bible uses that language. Judah, his people, have played the whore. They've run into the arms of other gods. And so you paint a picture in your minds, and forgive me if this is a, um, a hard image for you to, to, to think of, But it's what chapter 1 does for us. It's vivid. It would be outrageous, wouldn't it, for the wife of a loving, devoted husband to start going on dates and one-night stands with a load of other blokes. You'd hope that the husband isn't going to settle for that. It will cause his heart to break. And if she persists, no doubt he'll file for divorce. Then what? Well, if that happens, let's say to emphasize the effect the husband was the breadwinner, If that's the case, then all of a sudden, this woman, she is homeless. She's out on the streets. And then, the lovers that she was running to beforehand, they don't want anything to do with her. She's grotty. She's smelly. She doesn't look how she used to. Lost all of her glamour. We read in chapter 1, verse 19. I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and elders perished in the city while they sought food to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, for I am in distress. My stomach churns. My heart is wrung within me because I have been very rebellious. In the street, the sword bereaves. In the house, it is like death. Vivid imagery. In chapter four, moves from metaphor to As I said, Jeremiah is simply reporting fact. Uh, 4 verse 1, the second half of verse 1. The holy stones lie scattered at the head of every street. In other words, Solomon's temple, which had stood for roughly 400 years, has been destroyed. The theological message for Judah can't be any clearer in that moment for Jeremiah. You abandoned God. And so God's treated you like an adult. He's abandoned you. That's what you wanted, isn't it? Temple being where God dwelt with in the midst of his people. And then with the temple and the city walls lying in ruins, scanning the horizon, we see such horror. We see children begging for food. Verse 4, chapter 4. We see, this is horrific reading, that some women have boiled their own children to feed their empty bellies. Chapter 4, verse 10. I mean, it makes you want to be sick. It's an assault on our senses. And the people, even the spiritual leaders, they've been scattered. God's Abrahamic promise of a chosen people in a chosen land living under God's blessing seems to have been erased from history. And yet despite the pain of all this suffering, despite the pain of all the suffering at the Babylonians, Judah, they seem to acknowledge that they got what they deserved. And that's 
with hindsight, chapter 1, verse 18, the Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his words. For us, friends, I, I think it's so easy. I get into this trap sometimes, and it's, it's not right that we think that some sin is unavoidable. Or maybe we think a little sin here or there won't matter because it won't affect anybody else. Or we make excuses like, God wired me this way. If we're not failing to recognize the part we play in our sinning, we might instead be tempted to think that God's not concerned with these little things. He's got much, much bigger things on his mind, like civil war, than our sharp tongue or our wandering eye. Well, let Lamentations be a reminder to you that although... You can't see round the bend. Sin always has consequences, always. Either now or on judgment day. And therefore now, in the present, friends, is the time for confession. It's one of the reasons why we take times of confession so seriously during every Sunday service. Julie was leading into that beautifully as we were singing about Jesus taking the right place. And so often we forget that worship's all about him. We make it about ourselves. That was a song of confession if you didn't realize. We believe as a church, when we put our trust in Jesus, he washes us clean from all of our past, present, future sins. And yet we still are called in the Bible to confess and mourn our sin daily and weekly because we know if we don't, then our lack of confession will very quickly grow into indifference and then indifference will very quickly grow into disbelief. And before too long, we've forgotten all about sin. But there's a divine judge. And therefore, in the words of chapter 3, let us examine our ways and test them. And let us return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven and say, we have sinned and rebelled. Second lesson. And again, I think this could be pertinent for some of us. Don't live in the past. Don't live in the past. Very often with churches who are in decline or maybe not quite as full as they once were, temptations to look back to the glory days. Such churches often want people to judge them on their past rather than the present. And uh, and we invite people, maybe even to the evening service because it's different from the morning service. The amount of times one of us as a staff team, when welcoming people to the evening service, oh, morning's much, much bigger. (laughs) But maybe we think, okay, well, pre-COVID, like evening service, the morning service, we were using every single chair. So we say to the newcomers, oh, look, look, look past the empty seats. Ten years ago, we were thriving. And that newcomer says, I don't care about ten years ago. I've come now. What about now? What's going on now? Our problem is that when things start going bad for us, We simply bury our heads in the sand, pretend it's not that bad, or we sentimentalize and believe that our past held all the answers. And if only we could do things like we once did. The problem with such road-tinted spectacles is that it presupposes our past was perfect and sinless. There wasn't a black cloud in the sky. There most certainly was. Because from one generation to the next, we're all sinners. Friends, right now, Simple lesson for us is to wake up right now. I mean, we might be feeling weary. It's an evening service. I'm feeling a bit weary, but it's to wake up. And it's to act now. And it's to pursue God now. Today, this minute, this moment is the day, a moment of salvation. We hold out our hands again. We say, Lord, where do you want me to minister for you now? What do you want me to give up for you now? What can I do to bless your church right now? Chapter 4 highlights the devastation of Judah through simply contrasting Judah's past and her present. So, for example, verse 5, chapter 4. 
Those who once feasted on delicacies, what do they do now? Perish in the streets. Those who once were brought up in purple, embrace ash heaps. Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. The beauty of their form was like sapphire. Now, their face is blacker than soot. They're not recognized in the streets. Their skin is shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as wood. There's this explicit lesson Jeremiah is teaching to Judah. And it's that they didn't learn from their present. Their delicacies they ate, they became greedy rather than giving thanks. We've got to learn lessons from our past and put the action in, in the present. Right now is the time to act, friends. Right now is the time to make fresh resolves for God, even when you're sleepy. The lesson for Judah then, sitting in that ash heap, was to get up and act, not simply dwell on the past. It wouldn't get them anywhere, and it's the same for us. Maybe before you leave tonight, I'm going to say, right, tomorrow, Lord, I'm going to start my day by doing this. I've been thinking about doing this for some time now, and I've been putting it off because I've been waiting, waiting till all the things come into place and the environment's just perfect. It's never going to be perfect. You've got to act now, friends. Thirdly, hope in a dark place. Uh, part of navigating a time of personal suffering or of national tragedy is in not forgetting to look up. Right in the heart of Lamentations, in the longest chapter of personal pain, we find these words, chapter 3, verse 22. We tend to sing them. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Remember, he's feeling pain. He's in anguish and he says these words. It's a statement of faith. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And I think these verses teach us something about the purpose of suffering. Namely, that suffering can be the path, the path, by which God leads us back to himself. And I don't say that lightly. God is not spiteful. He's a loving husband. He's a loving father. And yet the breakthrough, if it comes during a time of suffering, is when we stop looking down at our feet or inwardly at our own turmoil or outwardly comparing ourselves to others who are smiling and succeeding. The breakthrough comes when we start to look up and we realize that he is the only one who can lift us up out of our pit and he's the only one who's walked through us every single step of our suffering. If you've ever been a sufferer, then you'll know that sometimes people can give you that tired look. Oh, they just want me to stop. If you've ever counseled somebody who's suffering, then you'll also know how hard it is to constantly, faithfully, loyally be putting an arm around their shoulder, even though you've heard the same thing a thousand times from their lips. God never gives up. All other lovers flee, as good as they might have been. God never gives up on caring for us. And when we look up, we see his bright shining light at the end of the tunnel. And despite how we're feeling right now, whether we're hiding in shame or hiding for our safety, those mercies of his never come to an end. They were new this morning. And if we hammer that into our psyche, then suffering will not rid me of hope. And it will save me of becoming a lonely island of bitterness and despair. And if this is true individually, then it's also true nationally. And I think this is a point of lamentation to remember. This is Judah weeping over national tragedy of a national rebellion. If Job was an individual suffering, Lamentations deals more with national suffering. The lesson's still the same. There's always hope. You know, if we think about uh, Israel and Gaza right now, bombs falling out of the sky, 
And yet that same sky displays beautiful sunsets. That same sky invites birds in all their different colours to swoop and swerve or soar on warm torrents of air. The world keeps on spinning on its axis because God is not dead. And so despite destruction, Judas shall return. It's always a hope with God, friends. In, in your plight right now, again, as Julie said, I don't have x-ray vision. I don't know what you're each going through. God does. There's hope. Fourthly and finally, there is a place for voicing concern to God. Lamentations teaches us so much about prayer. It teaches us that we can be entirely open and honest with God. We can tell him how we feel. I love these verses. Chapter 2, verse 20. This is Jeremiah. Look, Lord, and consider. Whom have you ever treated like this? Should women eat their offspring? The children they have cared for, should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? It's brutal honesty. In chapter 5, verse 1. Remember, Lord, what has happened to us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our homes to foreigners. Moving on to verse 19. You, Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. Why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? He's honest. These verses ooze feeling and pain. And the simple lesson, if these are the divinely inspired words of God, which they are, friends, is that we are to be real with God. Doesn't mean pointing the finger at him. Lamentations doesn't do that. Yet it might mean raising the question of how long our suffering is going to be or how long God's discipline is going to last. It's not necessarily accusing him of injustice. Some of the things we see in life, especially if we've ever personally experienced a time like Judah did in 586, they will leave horrifying images in our minds. And I've counseled people who've, who've lived through civil wars and seen things that I've only seen on movies and they struggle to go to sleep at night because those thoughts are etched in their minds. And it's futile, friends, simply trying to forget them. We'll replay them every night when we're trying to get to sleep. In one sense, they scar our memories and as with physical scars, scars don't just disappear. It makes more sense, therefore, to verbalise those images and that pain to God because he cares. He cares for his broken world. And as I said, that's what gives a dignity to our suffering. I don't know about you, but as I read through chapter 3, I struggled not to think of Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 10 I quote, like a bear lying in white wait, like a lion in hiding, he dragged me from the path and mangled me and left me without help. He drew his bow and made me the target for his arrows. And God is able to sympathize with us because in Christ he knows what it is to suffer. John Stott, some of you will know that name, we read his commentaries. He's got this great line when talking about the doctrine of atonement, which is how the cross works. And he says this, it's divine self-satisfaction by divine self-substitution. <coughs> divine self-satisfaction by divine self-substitution. God's justice and wrath at sin were born by himself in Jesus on the cross. Spiritually, Jesus can say a verse that I just read from chapter 3 of Lamentations, God made me the target for his arrows. Jesus says that on the cross. And as a sufferer, Jesus models being truly honest, lamenting, whilst at the same time expressing the heart God has for us. Take Luke 19 as an example, describing the second destruction of the temple. And he's sitting there, well, he approaches and then he, he stops and pauses. As he approached Jerusalem, I quote, and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, Jerusalem, if you, even you, had only known on this day that would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They'll dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They'll not leave one stone on another because you did not recognise the time of God's coming to you. In that sense, Jesus is saying, yes, God greatly cares about you. But today is the day of salvation. Don't delay. 
And he wants you to know that you can be so honest with him. So in conclusion, with this heavy book, lesson learned in the furnace of suffering. They do hurt. But friends, they're going to be some of the most profound lessons we learn in life. The lessons that I learned during my wife's postpartum psychosis. The, the lessons that have stayed with me and shaped me into the person God is continuing to make me. It's no surprise, therefore, that those able to inspire change will usually have been through Jesus' school of hard knocks. The people that I look up to have gone through severe times of testing and suffering. It's no surprise that as 318 delegates met for the very important 4th century church council at Nicaea, fewer than 12 had not lost an eye or lost a hand or did limp on a leg lame by torture for their Christian faith. Fortunately, as I close, suffering will one day come to an end because suffering has been defeated by suffering. The suffering of Jesus. And so we pause for a moment in prayer. Jesus, we thank you for this book. We thank you that it points us to you. We thank you that you could have spoken so many of these words that we read and they grieve us. That you have suffered. And you haven't just suffered for people out there, you've suffered for us, for me. We can each say that in this room. Jesus, you suffered for me, for my sin. And I own that. My sin. Jesus, I'm sorry, but I love you and I thank you because I wouldn't be able to call you my big brother, my saviour, my Lord, had you not done that. We love you, Jesus. And Jesus, I particularly want to lift up any in here who right now are going through a period of suffering. Please envelop them with your love, with your grace, with just enough grace for them to get through another day and enough grace tomorrow for them to get through tomorrow and so on and so on. And please, as all of those days add up, with your bright light at the end of the tunnel be growing stronger and stronger, Please be radiating their path with hope and life. Would your peace wash over and wash away the pain?